So yeah, that's our topic today. And I thought it's good to begin at the beginning and cover you know, some of our core security concepts like CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And in this case, with regard to zero trust, confidentiality meaning uh, not allowing unauthorized access to information or resources, integrity being uh, not being able to have those resources changed by unauthorized parties. And then availability is simply keeping services and, and resources up and running and available. So some of the risks that we see uh, that were made the news in late 2020 and continue to make the news even today uh, as they relate to um, confidentiality and integrity are the solar winds incident. It has many names today. Uh, Sunburst is the malware. SolarGate is Microsoft's name for it. Uh, but I also wanted to point out uh, the Ticketmaster uh, finding and then the Oldsmar water treatment plant in Florida that you may have heard about just in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and on the availability side, uh, there were some fairly significant cloud outages, as you can see listed here, over the last three or four months uh, that did impact uh, not only consumers, but uh, many businesses as well. So availability is also a, an ever-present concern as we head into 2021. Something happened there. Okay, so on the confidentiality and integrity perspective, so with Solar Winds, the SolarGate uh, event, that, as you know, probably had to do with getting malware actually into an IT supplier. Uh, Solar Winds network management software. Uh, what was particularly insidious about this is they were the APT threat actor was able to uh, get that into the build process. Um, and then that in turn was able to be used against uh, thousands of downstream organizations. With Ticketmaster, uh, it was a case that an it's an insider threat, a former employee uh, essentially copied a whole bunch of competitors' intellectual property and provided that to Ticketmaster. There was legal judgment against Ticketmaster, but you know it, it wasn't uh, a particularly heavy fine. Uh, but again, that's a breach of confidentiality by having a, a former employee take intellectual property from one company to the competitor. Uh, and really what's common between all three of these in some ways, uh, and with regard to the Oldsmar Florida water treatment plant, it's about too much access. Uh, you know, the, the former employees shouldn't have had access to Ticketmaster data. Uh, malicious actors shouldn't have been able to get access to the solar winds build environment, and then the uh, water treatment plant should not have been able to have been compromised from outside, especially. Uh, threats to availability include the ever uh, popular DDoS attacks. They're still out there. They may not make the news as much, but they're ongoing all the time. And then just general cloud service provider outages that may not be a result of a cybersecurity incident, uh, but still can have a very negative effect on uh, business performance. So what do we know so far about solar winds? We'll do a real quick overview of what's been published. Like I said, this solar winds was just one of the major vectors, uh, but this has a lot of names you see now, SolarGate and Sunburst. This was actually a timeline published by um, solar winds themselves. We see that activity started way back in September of 2019 uh, when the threat actor first accessed solar winds build environment. And this was a very methodical campaign. Uh, they, they built the code, they tested it, they figured out that they could uh, make sure that it was always present in the builds um, and, and had configuration control over it. I mean, it was, it was quite uh, sophisticated. Uh, that word gets used a lot with attacks, but uh, it's certainly not overhyped in this case. Then at the end of February, it was compiled and deployed uh, to customers. Uh, it's believed that it was live from March through June or thereabouts. Um, about 18,000 SolarWinds customers uh, reportedly had uh, downloaded that. And then as we often hear, the mean time to detection can be five or six months. It went from June until about December when FireEye noticed uh, activity and alerted solar winds. Within a few days, solar winds uh, made their uh, filing 
and notified customers, shareholders, and then produced a software fix for it. Uh, cybersecurity agencies around the world issued alerts soon thereafter, and we're still learning about you know, the effects uh, and how it was perpetrated even today. So mean time to detect kind of follows that pattern of six months. Mean time to resolve is, you know, we're two months into it now and it's it's still not over. We'll likely be working on this for months to come, the companies and organizations that have uh, fallen prey to it. So uh, besides SolarWinds, or at least with SolarWinds, we know or the Orion management uh, product also, <clears throat> the Serve FTP server was recently reported to have been compromised. FireEye forensics tools may have been copied, but they weren't compromised. Uh, Office 365 email was compromised for some customers of SolarWinds. That's how they were one of the targets that they had uh, attempted to acquire. Uh, Microsoft ADFS. It's also recently been learned that uh, Microsoft MQ server, an old version, was used by the SolarWinds uh, deployment, and it was compromised. And at least one case, they were able to uh, compromise the Cisco Duo multi-factor authentication for one customer uh, in order to gain access to their Outlook web access. Malwarebytes is also believed to have been affected by the same threat actor, but probably through a different vector. Uh, Mimecast may have been a, a victim too, but there's uncertain attribution around that. What impact does this have? Well, largely attention has been focused on government agencies, uh, particularly US, UK, Belgium, Canada, Israel, Mexico, Spain, and UAE. So it really has a global impact on government agencies, but also up to 18,000 companies including uh, 250 uh, other major companies, including other members of the IT supply chain. So that's why this is fairly significant. There have been three identified stages in the attack. Stage one would be the simple implantation of the malware, those 18,000 companies that downloaded it. Signs that that has happened or some, that something more than uh, an innocuous software install happened would be initial signaling uh, to the command and control domain. Um, stage two, a little bit more serious where uh, different C2 domains may have been contacted. There may have been a reconnaissance or looking around uh, the internal environment. There are multiple indicators of compromise available that are available through um, cyber threat intelligence sources to help companies or organizations determine whether or not they've made it to stage two. Stage three, is um, you know full compromise, lots of signs of threat activity or activities, including data exfiltration, manipulation of Active Directory accounts. Uh, they added accounts. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, sample tokens and even the unauthorized addition of federated trusts. So that's another way in which you know this is when people say it's a sophisticated attack, it really is pretty sophisticated. Uh, so what do we know about the SolarWinds posture over the course of the last year? Well, it's been widely reported that on their update server, uh, SolarWinds123 was the password. Uh, it's recently been discovered that the password was used inside the Microsoft SQL Server Express Edition that shipped with uh, SolarWinds Orion Management. Password spraying attacks may have been used to get initial access, or some accounts say that uh, Insider accounts were found on the dark web. That could have been the initial vector into SolarWinds itself. SolarWinds told customers that they should turn off anti-malware scans from the directories where it was installed. That's really a bad idea. They didn't have a CS, CISO uh, until fairly recently. And then they used out-of-date Microsoft Message Queue server and SQL Express. In, with those, they did not require authentication, authenticating the messages that went into the queue, and the admin uh, user password was uh, recorded in plain text. So how did they conceal what was going on at victims? They use VPNs for data exfiltration. That's you know fairly standard in some cases. What made it really different here, though, was the use of in-country IPs for command and control. 
That decreases suspicions if you're using things like EDR or XDR or SOAR products. Uh, you know, you're not necessarily phoning home to some, you know, distant location where uh, it would automatically erase suspicions if large data transfers were happening. Uh, it was also reported that steganography was used, hiding data in non-traditional file types, uh, sandbox detection, uh, where the malware would refuse to run if it thought it was in a sandbox. That's also a capability that's found in more commonly in advanced malware. This way it doesn't uh, set off alarms and can conceal itself. Variable communications delays, that, that's also a technique that's been used by APT actor groups in the past. You don't just exfiltrate everything all at once. It's slow and randomized again, so as not to trip over any um, uh, SOAR or SIM type products. And then lastly here, spoof SAML tokens without a corresponding local login event. Generally, there needs to be a, a local authentication event, but the malware itself was taking control of the SAML infrastructure and generating SAML tokens uh, for the use by the threat actors. Persistence, uh, like many forms of malware, it would load as a native service, so every time you would boot, it would come up again. It had fairly complex process monitoring, and it would only allow one instance of itself at a time to run, and it ensured that the proper infected version only ran during the period when uh, the campaign was going on. It added specific accounts to victims' active directories, and those accounts were different between each victim so far as has been uh, discovered. They also added tokens and certificates to different target services. This is how they were able to get access to like Microsoft Office 365 and Exchange. And then again, the addition of ADFS trusts to allow the threat actors to more easily federate into their victim environments. So how to detect? Uh, USCISA has put out a Sparrow script. It's a PowerShell script, open source thing. GitHub, but three major conceptual ways to look for it are impossible travel between login events for the threat actors. Um, you know, one account, maybe it's an account that shouldn't be in your active directory anyway, but if you notice it's logging in from different locations where it's physically impossible to do the travel, that's a good reason to suspect it. These SAML tokens, uh, they were noticed to have some unusual features like long validity duration, durations that are far longer than what most company policies would allow. They may not be conveying uh, authentication level information inside them when it's required. And again, there may not be a corresponding local login for the SAML uh, token. There are indicators of compromise available from threat intelligence providers. Uh, and if you're subscribing to those services, which you probably should, then uh, as they are discovered, they're released. So companies in stage one and two, um, if you suspect you're in that state, then you have to rebuild your hosts. Uh, you should create brand new accounts for SolarWinds usage. You should require multi-factor authentication for users of SolarWinds. And then since service accounts were affected too, you should use privileged access management products. Uh, use PAM to lock those accounts up into vaults and record activity. For stage three victims, you have to rebuild solar winds, but it's really, here's where the hard work comes in. You really need to perform a full IAM audit, look at all your Active Directory accounts, Azure AD, look at your ADFS configuration, other SAML infrastructure, uh, and purge it if necessary. It's time probably to do a full access reconciliation. Uh, look at all the permissions. I mean, if, if the threat actor has added accounts, permissions, certificates, tokens, whatnot, it all has to be cleaned up or, you know, they could, you know, reestablish a foothold. And then there may be other APT response actions you have to take, depending on what your IR team or consultants uh, may advise you to do. So just a little more on Ticketmaster and Oldsmar, not to forget them, different actors, different motives. The Ticketmaster case, again, was a former employee who copied confidential information. That was a case where it was too much access, that user should have been deprovisioned. Oldsmar, uh, an unknown actor, got access through a, 
an unused team viewer account so you know from a zero trust perspective get rid of software that you don't need get rid of inappropriate re re remote access and use multi-factor authentication to discourage password guessing So as we've been talking about today, zero trust architecture is more than just networking. It's about authenticating and authorizing every action in an environment. I won't say on the network because it's more than just the network. It's, you know, users. And what do we mean by users? It covers not just partners or employees and partners, but contractors and consumers as well. They have to be provisioned appropriately with the right amount of access, but also deprovisioned immediately so that you don't wind up in a situation uh, like the Ticketmaster event. Compromised credential intelligence can help uh, prevent uh, unauthorized account takeovers. Uh, devices, this is, uh, you know, not just computers and mobile phones, but IoT devices can be part of an authentication environment. They can collect uh, environmental attributes, you know, especially location and, and time of day and, and things like that. And then there are device intelligence sources that can provide you with additional factors about the device identity, the health of the device, and the reputation of the device as well. And then it should be considered on a resource by resource basis. And again, this is more than just networks, but the actual endpoint devices themselves, data elements, and then the servers, applications, and services that host the data. Ideally, we would all be using policy-based access controls with really rigid data access governance processes. But again, it's the authentication of users, applications, devices, uh, upon every uh, request to a resource um, it, with proper authorization as well. So how does this affect the supply chain? Well, if we improve confidentiality, integrity, and availability in the supply chain, uh, one way of doing that is implementing zero trust architecture, which is a process, not a single product. It's uh, it's about right sized access for any uh, any resource request in the environment, especially in the case of like remote access for the old Smar Florida water treatment facility, and deprovisioning deprovisioning terminated employees and contractors. You know, on the solar wind side, I think we have to subject vendors to much more rigorous security scrutiny. Um, there's uh, there's a trust that's implicit, and zero trust means you know trust but verify. So I think it's imperative that we, as a community, put more pressure on the IT supply chain to ensure that they are following best practices and can demonstrate that. On the threats to availability, we see more and more companies and organizations using edge services, doing that authentication and authorization for uh, resource access at the edge. I think 2021, uh, on, again, on the availability side, will be a, the year where we talk a lot about multi-cloud. If you're running services and infrastructure as a service uh, public providers, I think now is the time to start thinking about multi-cloud strategy. Uh, for availability. If you are using SaaS application providers, you may want to inquire whether or not they are also doing multi-cloud hosting. And we see on the horizon, uh, multi-cloud hosted and synchronized IDAS or identity as a service. And I think this is, especially in response to cases where you have large IDPs uh, with major outages affecting business application and authentication for lots of different enterprise services. This is something that we're gonna see a lot of development of in the not too distant future, just to meet uh, the availability needs of enterprises today.